you know, the amount of shows that I had gone to and I was like, whoa, I didn't know that you could do that uh, in comedy or you could do that on stage uh, was incredible. Welcome to Unsafe Space. I'm Carter Laren. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and leave us a comment if you feel so inclined. If you like our content, please consider supporting us by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. Recently, Carrie Smith and I had the opportunity to chat with Lou Perez. Lou is the former head writer and producer of We The Internet TV, host of the Lou Perez podcast, and author of How I Became a Far-Right Radical in the Wall Street Journal. You can follow him on Twitter at the Lou Perez and on his YouTube channel, the Lou Perez. And to support his work financially, visit the Lou Perez on Locals. You can check the show notes for links to all of those sites. Now, without further ado, here's our conversation with Lou Perez. I hope you enjoy it. Lou, welcome to Unsafe Space. Thanks so much for having me. Hi, Lou. I wanted to ask you about being a former writer of the, We the Internet, because I was looking at old, uh, old videos of yours last night, and you guys haven't done any in the past five months. Is We the Internet over? Um, as far as I know, um, they, the brand is continuing. I don't know what, what plans they have necessarily, but um, I am no longer uh, oh, okay. producing, producing content with them. Got it. So we can edit out that awkward question. No, no, we can leave it no, in. It's, it's cool. fine. Okay. It's cool. no, a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people are definitely, um, a lot of people are definitely interested in it. Um, uh, you know, the one thing that I that I that I wish is that I, I wish I could have just said like a, a more formal goodbye to uh, you know to all the fans uh, over there. Um, I, I had a really good run of five years and built up like a, a really cool fan base, very supportive one, and. Uh, it, now I'm sort of finding like sort of starting from scratch, uh, you know, sort of how do I, uh, you know, just get people to know that I'm creating new content, you know, over in different, uh, in different areas. So it's something that I'm, uh, that I'm trying to navigate, but, um, on the, on the bright side, I have some, I have my podcast and then I'm also going to be producing some new sketch comedy content. So that's, uh, uh, so I'm really excited about that. I was going to ask, so are you a, do you do stand up or sketch or you, I mean, you're obviously a writer, like what kind of comedy do you do? Primarily? Yeah, I, I, uh, I do it. I, I do it all. Um, uh, for the primary of uh, the uh, primarily for the past, like, you know, five years or more, I've been doing uh, sketch comedy and with, uh, we, the internet TV, it was sort of the first time that I had taken sort of my sketch experience and then my, you know, political uh, uh, thoughts and, and brought them together. Um, but yeah, I've been doing uh, sketch comedy, stand-up comedy, uh, the written word and all that. And, um, <laughs> and Carrie, I think we, we probably have this connection at the, um, at the UCB. That's where I, that's where I started doing uh, sketch comedy uh, back in, in New York. I mean, how long ago was that? Yeah. I think 2004, I mean, it would have been like that far back doing a live sketch. Wow. So did you see, and in, uh, it's funny, I was just having coffee with someone and we were talking a little bit about comedy and about wokeness and comedy and uh, gatekeepers and such. Did you see um, wokeness invade that space at UCB, would you say? Or no, is that well, something Can you tell just... everyone what UCB is for those who aren't in the like circuit? I don't know what you're sure, talking about. Sure, sure. Um, the UCB theater is the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater. And okay. uh, it's been a while since I've hosted uh, uh, Harold Night. Uh, so Harold Night was a, uh, a night of improv and they would have groups host and they would say that the Harold was invented by uh, Del Close and brought to New York by the original four of the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater. Um, wow, I feel like a total geek uh, going back there. You sound like <laughs> it, so keep yeah. going. It's good. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the UCB Theater, there, it was uh, in New York City and then eventually in L.A., and it was uh, improv and sketch comedy and then also 
an improv and sketch comedy school. And uh, when I was when I was there, you know, to answer your question, Kerry, uh, I, I I was there when there was sort of no rules. It seemed like um, where any show, you know, there was just just limited um, unlimited possibilities of what you could see and what you could do. And you know, the amount of shows that I had gone to, and I was like, whoa, I didn't know that you could do that uh, in comedy or you could do that on stage uh, was incredible. There was one time uh, every year there was this thing called the the Del Close Marathon, and oh, just, yeah. and just to you know just to give you an idea of what things were like in my time uh, over there uh, during the Del Close Marathon, which was uh, I don't know if it was like a whole weekend of just nonstop improv. Uh, they did a show called Emancipov, and uh, if you're trying to think of what you know what constituted Emancipov. It was basically all of the black performers from the theater pretended to be slaves performing improv for their white slave man. <laughs> oh my God. Fucking it. And it, it, it was, I think that might have been the only time I remember at that theater where I felt physically like, oh my God, what am I watching? And like, I had to like step out. And I told one of the, um, uh, afterwards, I told one of the performers who had, who had a, uh, whose idea it was to do that, a black performer. I was like, dude, you made me so uncomfortable. And he's like, yeah, I know that was fucking awesome. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, so, so I was there when stuff like that would happen on stage. And then, um, you know, I, I, as it happens, you, you know, you start performing and, you know, different venues doing different things. Uh, my, my partner, Greg and I, we started doing more stuff online on, on YouTube. So we were sort of taking a, you know, taken away from the theater, we would check back in every now and then try to do a show or something like that. But it was only like the past, I don't know, uh, maybe like five years or so, where uh, I just started hearing secondhand about all of the woke shit sort of invading, uh, mm -hmm. invading the, uh, the space. And I was like, I, I'm like, this doesn't sound like the theater that I know. And in particular, I was hearing stuff like, you know, the UCB is a is a grounds for white supremacy and, and all this stuff. And I was like, what the, what are you talking about? Like everybody I knew there were, you know, like caring people of the left, you know? And it was like, I was like, I have no idea what the hell, what the hell is going, is going on there. And now, you know, now it's gone. I mean, now there's, I guess, no more UCP. There might be some online classes or something like that, but uh, the theaters, have literally shut down. And um, I think they're uh, the owners of the UCB, the original UCB four are now going to be handing it over to, you know, somebody else. So, yeah. So I, I mean, we, the internet, I mean, first of all, it was the stuff you were doing was hilarious. So thank you. Thanks. For thank doing you. That. Um, but it was also, uh, you know, you made fun of both sides, at least as the Overton window had been defined until very recently. You made fun of both people on the right and views coming from the right and stuff on the left. Uh, it was kind of, I would say, irreverent in, in the way that, you know, we've we kind of want from comedy generally. Um, but something uh, something that you did start doing is you started making fun of the one thing that I think you're not allowed to make fun of, which is the social justice movement. Can you tell me when you started doing that and when you noticed some pushback there? Um, man, I mean, if there, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, how, how would I just describe this? I think, I think, you know, one of the, one of the great things about, about comedy is that, you know, it gives you an opportunity to call out bullshit. And, um, you know, it seemed like, you know, SJWs and the like were, you know, getting a lot of airtime and, uh, you know, and, uh, I don't know, they were, I was looking around, I'm like, well, you know, not a, uh, people aren't necessarily making fun of them in the way that I wanted to, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. It, it, it seemed like the material was there and nobody was really, uh, you know, taking advantage of that. And I'm like, oh, well, I, I have some, some thoughts on this whole thing. And I think it, and I think I could be funny. So why don't I, 
you know, why don't I go see, see what happens? And it was pretty early on. I mean, I did a, a trigger warning sketch back in 2015. I did a, a, a safe space sketch back in, in 2015. So I guess in a way it was sort of, uh, I, I don't know if it was ahead of the curve, but, uh, but you know, I, I'm glad I got in there when I did. I would say it, it is ahead of the curve because it is hmm. like you, you, uh, you noticed correctly, I would say that nobody was taking an opportunity to make fun of some things that are like, not that they're low hanging fruit, but they are fruit that's hanging there and nobody's picking it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, why is this a sacred topic? And, right. and as you said, part of the purpose of comedy is to call out bullshit or to point out truth. And, uh, and to, and there are no, at least I don't think there are very many, I can't think of anything I would say as a taboo, sacred topic, but social justice functions in some ways like a fundamentalist religion. And so people treat it with that kind of sacred reverence of you shall not make fun of this. And mm -hmm. so you were ahead of the curve to be doing that in 2015. Absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, you know, I would, I would give, so, um, for, I would give an, an example of that would be, I, I made two videos, um, where I played a member of Antifa. So I was, you know, basically dressed like, like a, people would call me out. They'd say like, Oh, you dress like a ninja. Uh, so I was dressed like a ninja sort of making fun of Antifa. And I did an interview with, um, uh, Christian Toto who has a, a podcast called Hollywood and Toto. And he had asked me, he's like, <laughs> he had asked me about, you know, doing that and sort of like, well, what, you know, well, why do you think, you know, SNL isn't doing this or, or anybody else? And, and part of it, I was like, uh, you're thinking like, oh, maybe I'm just so original. Um, but, but, you know, but I, I'm not, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I was, I was thinking, I was thinking like, like, does anybody else just see how ridiculous this crew is? Like, th does anybody see the comedy? uh, there. And, you know, I, 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 nobody told me about, you know, what I was allowed to make fun of or not make fun of. So I just saw that as a, as a legitimate target for mockery. And then I, you know, went, went forward with that. It, it, and as far as, as, as pushback goes, um, you know, I think overall there were, you know, the really, uh, there are really positive responses to um, to a lot of the stuff that that I put out. My my favorite comments always come from people who say, "Hey, you know, I, I don't agree with you on everything, but the stuff that you make that I like, I like, and the stuff that you don't make, well, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, or the stuff that you make that I don't like, uh, I'm still going to stick around to see what you make." And and that and that's really good. But um, pushback came in 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 other ways where last year we were supposed to do a live show in Dallas. And we had rented a space, I guess, in a, uh, it was like a, I guess like a black box theater, like a small improv theater. And last minute, I, I think it was the night before the, uh, the show was canceled. Um, the owners of the establishment had canceled because they had gotten, uh, complaints from their staff saying that due to the material that I had made, uh, they didn't feel safe. Wow. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's one thing where were they talking about because they they thought you were a real Antifa member? Oh, oh no, no. It, oh, I'm just, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they probably would have liked me. Yeah, if I, if I was like a real Antifa member. If uh, you were actually setting things on fire and beating people up, then you would be invited. But exactly, you're just exactly. making fun of that. So yeah. So it was yeah. it was sort of like I, by that by last year it was sort of I had this whole body of work that uh made i guess these the members of the staff feel unsafe the prospect that i would be there um you know in person would make them feel unsafe so it's one thing where look uh if you criticize me if you think that what i'm doing isn't funny fine if you think what i'm doing is wrong fine uh you know but the idea that i'm making that i would make you feel unsafe you know is just uh that 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 just takes it to a level uh, that I can't understand, and also I can't imagine somebody legitimately feeling that way. Um, I'm not that big of a guy. I'm only five foot ten. You know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not that intimidating of a person. You know, I mean, I have a big forehead going on right now, and a, and a 
Big. Well, that's kind of scary, to be honest. I it's mean, the, the nice thing about actually. saying that you, that someone makes me feel unsafe, though, right, is it's it's there's no null hypothesis. I don't have to back that up with any facts or anything else. I feel X is a, a statement that can't be questioned. And in an environment in which my feelings control, well, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I, I didn't I didn't necessarily think of, think about it that way, but. Yeah, I think that that is a good way to to put it. And it's like, what could I, what can I possibly do to make somebody feel safe? It's like I, you know, sorry, I, I the uh, the videos are out there; they've been made. No, no, nobody was injured in the making of these uh, of these videos. <laughs> um, and and also, you know, I'm I'm one of those I'm one of those people. I'm a very I'm a staunch defender of free, uh, freedom of speech. I I do not like the idea of initiating force against people I disagree with. Um, I hate that idea. I hate um, the idea of, of mobs and bullying people. Um, so, you know, I, so you can imagine that, you know, being told that I made someone feel unsafe was just, uh, was, was, was shocking to me. So. Sure. It's a, it's just a manipulative tactic, as Carter's saying, because you can't. There's no defense against it. It's a feeling that it's a subjective feeling they they claim to be having, and you can't. You're not a lot. I mean, there's no way to say, well, I don't believe you that you, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, and and <laughs> there's and, and they may legitimately be feeling that, but that's not really relevant in civil society, right? Um, how they feel doesn't, shouldn't really factor into anything. Um, mm-hmm. but we've, we've now entered a culture in which how they feel is more important than any attempt to have uh, a rational discussion or, or look at objective evidence about, you know, what you've and, done that might make a reasonable person feel unsafe, and mm-hmm. what, uh, which and I what assume is, is nothing. What's so crazy about it too, is that they're then using the subjective feelings of harm or unsafeness to push something that actually is harmful to push censorship, to say that you don't have a right to rent that space or to do your show or to speak because like it, that's what I really hate about the, this part of the, the movement is the way that they oppose free speech and they, they oppose the exchange of ideas. And, and if that includes uh, comedy and making people laugh, because th- then they don't care. Mm-hmm. They're happy to attack comedy. I saw at a, a, a college um, sometime in the past two years, it, they were protesting a uh, documentary about Lin- Lenny Bruce being shown. And it's like, so wait, who's protesting it? Oh, it's the leftists. <laughs> it's the SJW people. They don't want us to, to uh, you know, it, my have times changed. Like who are the fundamentalists now? Anyway, that's really dis- disappointing. I didn't know that you had been uh, barred from a theater. Yeah, and it was a, you know, it was a, it was a small theater. Uh, we made the conscious choice not to make a big stink about it because uh, we sort of felt like, uh, look, it, you know, it's it's their property, and you know, if they don't feel comfortable, um, that's fine. We didn't, in the same way that uh, we don't believe, I don't believe in mob justice. I didn't want to, you know possibly unleash the mob onto them and, you know, bad mouth them and, and all that. Um, you know, but, but ultimately I, you know, I wish there was an opportunity there to, to have, to have a discussion. I would have sat down and talked with the staff before the show or, you know, and, 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 and whatnot. Um, a similar thing happened. I made a, a documentary, mini documentary called five reasons why we need hate speech. And the goal of the documentary was, to show that you know the very people who call for hate speech laws, who uh, who call for censorship, oftentimes they're the ones who are actually going to be the victims of it. And um, I had the opportunity to talk to a lot of uh, academics and journalists on the left who were in favor of very strong First Amendment uh, protections. Whether it's um, Glenn Greenwald was in uh, was in the documentary, uh, Nadine Strassen, uh, former president of the ACLU, journalist Jesse Single. Um, and even in that documentary, I was supposed to have a discussion with a group of college students who went to Fordham University who uh, were trying to, if, if I remember it correctly, they were trying to get a uh, club status for a uh, 
a BDS movement, um, boycott, divestment, and sanction of Israel, and they weren't allowed to uh, to form a club. It was something like that. And I wanted to talk to them and to you know say, hey, you know, I think I think that you should be able to get a um, should be able to get a club. And then they watched previous videos that I had made and refused to talk to me because they thought that I, uh, in their opinion, I give a platform to, I don't know, what was it? Fascists and, uh, you know, just race scientists. I think that was one of the things that they said, uh, all of which was, was, was untrue, but it was one of those, you know, one of those grand ironies where it's like, Hey, you're actually, um, you know, you're actually pushing away an ally who, you know, would stand up and, and, and speak on and defend you, you know, and speak on your behalf for some invented reasoning, you know, some invented bullshit. Yeah. You know, you're reminding me of, um, you wrote, so in, in your wall street journal article, how I became a far right, uh, radical you're it's, it's in response to this paper that I think, you know, we've talked about before, uh, I think it was circulating the internet a little bit. It's called evaluating the scale growth and origins of right wing echo chambers on YouTube. It's, uh, you know, the, the people that r wrote it are from places like uh, University of Pennsylvania, Harvard, um, you know, not, not, you know, Microsoft research. I mean, you know, real, real places. And, um, and in this, in this paper at the end, they have this, this list, this categorization of people that are right and far right. And, and if you just look through the list, it's, I mean, it's, incredibly inclusive in terms of who's in the far right <laughs> sure. in a way that just makes very absolutely diverse. no sense. It's very, yeah, it's a very diverse yeah. list of, of far right. Like, oh. And you, so one of the things that I, I, a point you made in this article, I just want to read your words back to you. Cause I, this, this point, I think I haven't really heard people make this point, but I think it's a really good one about um, the tactics that they use uh, here. And, and you write, at first, I found it odd that the words fascism, racism, and terrorism were missing from the paper um, because these terms have become inextricably linked to the far right. Then I realized it was a smart and cowardly move on the part of the authors to leave them out. Just use the umbrella term far right and allow your readers to fill in the tacit isms. That way, you don't risk being called out for labeling people who are not fascists, racists, and terrorists as such. Instead, the study is peppered with nebulous adjectives like extreme and radical, which allow user, well, readers to see their own boogeymen. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about that for a minute because it's a, you're, I think you're right. It's a tactic mm -hmm. and it's effective. Yeah, I'm, uh, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, if you get, I think, you know, sort of like what I said, you know, you get, you get labeled far right and all of these images come up. I hear far right. I start thinking of, uh, you know, neo Nazis in 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 Eastern Europe. I, I start thinking of church bombings. I start thinking of of really terrible stuff. And you know, how many people? You know, if 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 even me, if I hear though, you know, I hear those words and I have all these images in it. How many people are gonna are gonna be willing to say, hold on a second? I know that those that those images are are terrible. Um, but let me talk to this person and actually see what they, you know, what they really believe. Uh, I think it becomes a, uh, you know, a shorthand categorization that basically says uh, this person should not be spoken to. This person is not worthy of, of respect yes. or the benefit of the doubt or the benefit of the doubt or a good faith argument. Um, and that really, you know, that really pissed me off um, because uh you know, if someone doesn't want to work with me or if somebody is, uh, you know, uh, you know, wants to talk about reasons why, you know, I'm, you know, a terrible person, at least let it be based on stuff that I've actually said or done or actually believe, um, you know, rather than, you know, this sort of thing. Yeah. It's you know, the other the other effect it has broadly is apart from its impact on you personally is is broadly uh i was thinking about this after you wrote that the way to shift the overton window over time is to take people who are not outside of the window and just uh, uh, but but outside of the window that you wish existed 
and just start throwing terms like radical and extremist. And it, that's those terms are a way to uh, assert your definition of what the window is. By saying you're a radical and extremist, I'm asserting that that's outside of the window of, of acceptable discourse. This guy is outside. And the more I can throw, the more normies I can throw in, <laughs> into that, the more I get the window to kind of shift and maybe even narrow to exactly what I want, think the world, the correct worldview is. Right. Well, and it's also a way to keep, it's the guilt by association thing. As you said, Lou, they want people to refuse to work with you by smearing you in this way. So that, that circle of what is considered far right, which basically, as far as I can tell, just means anyone who's not speaking social justice. Um, <laughs> you, as you pointed out, they included uh, Brett Weinstein in their far their uh, their far right list. He's a progressive, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, Sam Harris, who's a liberal, like they did that. It's just kind of crazy the people they lumped in there. But these people all speak against wokeness. You know, Brett Weinstein's an actual progressive. He's not a social justice leftist. Um, and so, as the, the more that they do that, then they're it's 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 they're trying to create a fear of association. So people are afraid to associate with you. And if they do associate with you. Well, then they get smeared. Oh, they associated with far right. They're part of far right too. And then, and that circle of who is, who you can't listen to just gets bigger and bigger. I hate, I hate that guilt by association game. I think it's so dumb. Yeah. The Um, adjacent, right. What right wing adjacent or alt right adjacent or whatever you want to call it. And, and this is something that, that really concerns me because, um, you know, over the years with, uh, with we, the internet, I made hundreds of videos, right. In so many of the, and you know, when you add up all the sketches, that's just a ton of crew members and a ton of actors and actresses who worked with me, right? Yeah. And you know, I've th- I've thought about this where if I put out a particularly controversial video, and it's controversial because you know it happens to poke fun at the you know at the wrong subject, right, or the takes on the wrong sacred cow. If I make that video, and then I have a completely different video that has, you know, say an aspiring actor or actress in it that I, you know, cast two or three years ago. The idea that, 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 you know, this actress or actor is inextricably linked to me and that someone might say, well, wait a minute, if this actor or actress worked with Lou Perez, I mean, they must be an awful person. So, um, I, I don't, I don't think it's happened yet. And I really hope that it never happens because, um, I've, I've been I've been really lucky to work with some incredibly uh, talented people, but man, if I really don't want to fuck up anybody's career because they because they happen to be in a video that I made, you know, um, I just it just wouldn't wouldn't sit well with me. But that's how much not, do you self censor I mean, as a result of that? What like does that make you self censor? Um, you know, there were there was a time when I was. Uh, it was sort of before I I stepped in front of the camera as much as I as I uh, as, as I ended up doing, where I was writing the I was writing scripts, and I was writing them, and then I would then after I'd write them, I'd be like, "Ooh, is so and so going to be comfortable with this? Is so and so going to be comfortable with that?" And that's such a just such a shitty situation to be in when you're trying to create anything, you know, the, the idea you're, you're, as an artist, uh, you're already second guessing yourself at every turn being like, is this good? Is this going to be good? Um, and then, you know, thinking like, Oh, I don't know if so-and-so will be up for it, but, you know? So, uh, a way to get around that was, um, definitely being in more stuff and saying, well, I, I'm cool with this. So I'm going to be, uh, be a part of this and taking ownership of that. And then also just not taking it personally. If an actor or an actress says that they're not, you know, right. not around, they're not, they're not available. And, um, for anybody out there, what, what you guys should definitely do is, um, just to not as a way not to make it awkward for the actor, you know, don't just call up an actor and see if they're available on a certain day, right? Make sure, you send them a script and say, are you available on this day? Please read the script because yes. then they can get back to you and say, I'm not available, which is a, which could be either they're really not available or it's a nice way for them to saying you're out of your fucking mind. I'm not going to do this script. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I've been a, a few of the, the things that I've been casting um, there. I have a hunch that, you know, some of the actors are like, Ooh, this, this, this content is not, 
not to my liking. Um, but, you know, ultimately, you know, uh, I've been lucky to also find like a, like a really great stable of actors who really dig what I'm doing and you know, like to be a part of it. And they come with uh, enthusiasm, they come with, um, they feel free to make suggestions as well. And be like, hey, what if we did it this way? And I'm, I'm all about that. Uh, when it comes the the collaborative process is is definitely a fun one and uh yeah. are you are you familiar with uh my friend clifton duncan he did an interview with us he's an he's an actor uh who has recently come out of the closet as not being woke and is awaiting his cancellation and <laughs> Oh, but, but uh, I think you would really dig him. Anyway, I should probably yeah. say this when we're yeah, not yeah, recording. Maybe. But well, you should we'll make, him. Uh, make connect- yeah. yeah, I'm I'm all about making those uh making those connections. I, yeah, I, I, that's what those. he was saying. Is like we need to start meeting more people. He's in a place where he's just looking to make connections and meet more people in entertainment who are not woke. And th- because sometimes I think they succeed by it's a. I do believe it's still a minority of people who are the true believers who are really rabid, but they are the most vocal and they get, they, they seem like they are large in number and they, they convince all these other people in the middle to kind of go along with it out of fear. And so mm-hmm. the more that you meet people in any segment, any type of uh, uh, community, but you know, let's say in the entertainment community or the comedy community who are not woke, I think, the better it is. Cause we can start to realize like, Hey, we're not, we're not, it's not just me. There's lots of other people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're not, al- you're not alone in it. And, and I think the more, the more that you have people speaking out, you know, the, the more, uh, the better it's going to be. I, it was only the other day when, uh, a guy who I've, I've known for a number of years hit me up on Facebook and basically and, and, and called himself a coward. He's like, I know I'm a coward. I was so close to posting this on, on one of these uh, posts that I, that I put out there, he's like, but I'm just, I'm just going to share it with you for your eyes, for your eyes only. Um, because he was, he was afraid of possibly offending somebody at his job and, you know, who knows what, you know, yeah. what will happen there. But I think it, what I'm happy about, what I'm happy about is that, you know, uh, for one, I, I, I wish this guy was a little bit more brave. That would be, you know, that would be great. I think overall for everybody, but he's not there yet but he feels comfortable enough where he's like, I can trust Lou that I could, could tell Lou what I'm really thinking. And he's not going to be one of these, guys, one of these people who tries to, you know, come at me or, or use this against me, um, you know, in the, in the future. And, I'm, and uh, you know, at least, at least there's that. <laughs> so. Yeah. Has your categorization as a far right radical in this paper um, led to more people in the industry kind of secretly reaching out to you? Yeah. Yeah. I've had a, I've, uh, I, I almost, I had almost forgotten that I had a website and, and then I, <laughs> and then I had like people, uh, people reaching out to me, uh, to, through the website. I'm like, Whoa, okay. Um, so yeah, actually, um, I'm, I'm, I have, a an interview that, that's going to be coming up with a, um, uh, with a professor at a university uh, who read the article, reached out to me to to talk about that, um, and uh, and yeah, a, a number of uh, a number of other people have have reached out to me as well. So that was cool. I mean, it's I, I you know it, w- it was sort of like uh, I was really really happy with the response that I got uh, from it, both both the positive stuff and the negative stuff. There was a lot of material that came out on on Twitter of people coming after me, calling me a, a whiny bitch and, and, and all that. And I'm like, you know, uh, every now and then I like to, uh, I like to put on my, my Twitter gloves and, and have a little, little Twitter fight. So it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about, um, I mean, I'm just curious, what is your, what are some of your favorite, I don't know, like what's some of your personal favorite kind of comedy to watch? And where do you find us currently? What, what, what's the state of comedy right now? Like, I don't, I'm not a person who think that I don't think wokeness can kill comedy, but I definitely think comedy uh, in terms of what's being sold and, and put out into the mainstream right now is suffering. Mm -hmm. I do believe that. Um, What is your, what is some of your favorite kind of comedy and what do you think is the state of comedy right now? Yeah. So, um, 
this is going to sound insane, but uh, I really just discovered Mel Brooks. Okay. <laughs> uh, it, I know. It, uh, it, where, where has this 90 some odd year old man been my whole life? Um, but I've gone back and started watching Mel Brooks stuff from uh, Blazing Saddles, uh, Young Frankenstein. And then uh, the last one, uh, uh, what, what was the last one I watched? Uh, the producer. So it was like the producers, Young Frankenstein, and then Blazing Saddles. Okay. And uh, a lot of people talked about how Blazing Saddles could never be made now today. And what they cite is that the use of the uh, of the N word or the overuse of the N word in that movie. And I watched the movie, and uh, I I've come to the conclusion. That the reason why that movie can't be made today is because it's fucking insane. It is such an insane <laughs> movie. At the look, uh, if you haven't seen it yet, spoiler alert: it ends with a bunch of cowboys breaking the fourth wall on a Hollywood set and then having a big fight brawl with hundreds of gay dancers. Like, <laughs> and there, there is something, uh, you know, to the insanity of Mel Brooks that I just, I've just, I've just, uh, gotten so much strength from recently where it's sort of like, Oh man, this, this stuff has been out here the whole time and it's been influencing me without me even knowing that yeah. it's influencing me. And I mean, uh, you, yeah. but you're kind of saying this as a joke that they couldn't be made because it was insane, but there's, there's truth to that in that, you know, you talked about this actually, I think in your interview with Lionel uh, Shriver, I remember you you both talking about art having really no purpose in the sense that it is a frivolous, nice to have thing. You can survive in a society without a lot of art. Um, it's a it's a nice to have. And um, it seems like when the when art becomes, which it, I think to a large extent has, when art becomes a vehicle for uh, political indoctrination or, or assertion of political principles or trying to influence people, um, it loses some of that frivolity and, and which I think is that craziness you're referring to. Am I, am I crazy for reading too much into this? No, no, I think, no, I think, I think that's great. Um, and yeah, that was a blast getting to talk to, uh, to Lionel, uh, Shriver. Um, she was great. And, and yeah, I, I had, I had never really thought about it, you know, sort of put into those, into those words until, uh, until I, sp I spoke with her about it. Um, and yeah, it, it's, I think it's one of those things where, you know, we, if you look at, you know, some, some people's, uh, bios, whether it's on, you know, social media or, or elsewhere where it's like, I'm a comedy activist or an activist comedian. <laughs> and you're like, Oh no, man, like, like one of those things is going to win out and chances are it's going to be the activist part. And, you know, nobody, I don't know, uh, nobody, I think, likes to be, you know, preached to, or maybe they do. Uh, I, I don't know. But uh, no, it's, uh, well, you know, I used to work in social justice comedy. I did this for 20 years. I, I used comedy to push the social justice ideology. And I primarily worked with comedians who subscribe to social justice ideology to some degree or another, some more than others. Um, but we... I viewed what I was doing, I viewed it as uh, using laughter to educate people. Mm -hmm. and it was really like indoctrination. But anyway, it, what happens there is that laughter becomes the servant of indoctrination. Comedy is the servant of the ideology. And so comedy necessarily is coming second then. It's not the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's one of the the big problem. It's not that you can't have woke comedians who are funny. I still think there are some, some woke comics I used to work with who I find some of their jokes, some of their material funny. It's just that at the end of the day, that's not their guiding principle. Their guiding principle is spreading the ideology first and their comedy will necessarily suffer. I think they are holding themselves back and they're restraining themselves and putting a cage around themselves because there are topics they won't touch that are sacred and because their number one ideology is indoctrinating people. It's not making people laugh, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. No, so no. activist comedian. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think this. I have a problem with that. I want to say this. This is not re really relevant. You just made me think of an old quote that it used to be one of my favorite quotes. And now I have to think about it more and think about why I liked it. And if I still like it, I think I still like it. 
uh, one of my favorite Mel Brooks quotes was, um, uh, tragedy is when I cut my finger. Comedy is when you walk into an open sewer and die. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Which yeah. there's something about that that I'm like, what he's kind of commenting on, you know, when it happens to me, it's hard to see the humor in it because it's just all pain and tragedy. But when it's off, it could be something much worse happening to you, and it's easy to see the the humor in it. Anyway, you, you know, you know, um, so uh, 2020 obviously was an insane year for everybody, um, and I I had a baby. I lost my job. Congratulations, I, by the way. Thank you. On, on both, actually. It's been, it's both <laughs> yeah, been incredibly, yeah, uh, incredibly freeing. It's, it's been awesome. Um, and, you know, at the, uh, at the end of the year, a, uh, a, an old friend of mine passed away. He, uh, he died. He was 44 years old, incredibly young. And I went to the, I went to the funeral and um, he, he, uh, if anyone anyone's out there, so I grew up as a kid in in Woodside, Queens. So when I was so when I back, went back to the funeral, I was reunited with so many of the guys that I grew up with, and uh, this particular group of people are just ball busters, storytellers, and just big drinkers and really really funny guys, and. You know, we're at a funeral. We're standing outside the funeral home. Uh, somebody brought, you know, it's like a garbage bag with beers in it and ice, and we're drinking beers out, uh, outside. And everyone's telling stories about our friend who passed away. And all the stories, th th there's no like, these aren't like, oh, yeah, you know, he helped me change a tire one day. No, it was about, yeah, he drank so much and he couldn't get his dick hard. And we were trying to fuck, you know, these twins about, you know, just all these, <laughs> you know, all these stories that are just incredible mishaps and just dudes behaving badly and, and screwing up. And these are all the types of stories that you need at a funeral that you need to hear. Our buddies inside, daddy's in a box and we are laughing over these insane stories that were only possible when this, because this human being was alive when he was alive. And there was something there that was just so cathartic and so yeah. life affirming about being a part of that. And there's something when, when I listen to, to when I watch a Mel Brooks movie or when I listen to Richard Pryor, you know, mm -hmm. where there, it's, it's so life affirming and it could be, um, I don't know. It could be, it could be very, very moving. And, uh, I hadn't had that, that feeling with comedy, you know, in a long time. And I think a lot of it had to do with, uh, produced comedy under a, you know, a specific brand that wasn't totally mine, that wasn't totally independent. And, uh, I'm trying to get back to that feeling that feeling of insanity in a way of, you know, taking this world, making sense of it, but then also making it a little bit more insane. Um, and, uh, yeah. So that's, yeah. That, that's my goal with comedy, I guess. You know, you're making me think of that. This is something that I, I just assume it's my own personal preference. I don't have a real good argument for it, but as a child of the eighties, um, I look back on the eighties and I say, you know, there was some, I mean, I've used this phrase before, and it's interesting that you use that. I, there was something life affirming about the, at the general attitude in the 80s. And it seems like we're in an era culturally in which life affirming is either mocked or ridiculed, and we're all supposed to be depressed nihilist. Mm. Yeah. Is that just me? I don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. There, there, is, there is something, there is something there. And, and just a, it seems like like a lack of perspective as well about where we are, you know, historically and what people were dealing with, um, you know, even, you know, 30 years ago, 40, you know, 40 years ago. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know how, how often, you know, people really take stock in, in what, uh, in how good we have it, you know, and, um, I'm, I'm guilty of it. Uh, I'm totally guilty of it as well. You know, you have people, uh, you know, c people who are, you know, comedians who think they're entitled to do comedy for a living, who think that they're entitled to an audience, who think that, 
you know, who you see them complaining about, oh man, now we got, uh, man, these TikTok stars and these podcasters and they're, you know, that blah, 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 you know, complaining about all these people who are also trying to navigate this, this, you know, weird world that, that we're living in and try to, and trying to make a career out of it. And, you know, going back to what Lionel said, like, you know, you know, art is, is a, is a, is a luxury, you know, damn, you know, the idea that, you know, even the three of us are right now, you know, communicating with one another, what a luxury we have to be able to, um, to talk to one another about, you know, ab about this stuff. And, um, that's something that I've, I, I think I need to do a better job as well, of really, um, sort of really being in the moment and being like, wow, man, I'm, I'm pretty lucky to be here and, and have the life that I, uh, the life that I have. So, yeah, and as far right cool. radical as I am. Yeah. That's crazy talk. I don't know. You we know, should ban you. <laughs> this might be a little taking us off subject just a bit, but Carter, when you're talking about this sort of, I don't know, from the the comedy of the 80s and 90s being a bit more, what was the word you used? Life affirming. It, it was life yeah. affirming. Okay. I was just having this conversation a couple days ago um, uh, about music. My fellow was telling me about how. Oh, I feel the same way about music, by the okay. way. Same thing. Okay. But yes. listen, this, this, I, I'm not as familiar with some heavy, the heavy metal stuff. Like I knew it, but I didn't really pay much attention to it. And he was like, if you look at the metal from the eighties, if you look at the lyrics of Ozzy Osbourne or Metallica, they're positive. Yeah. <laughs> like even though the music is like it's metal and everything, but the lyrics are stuff like, uh, like crazy, but that's how it goes. Millions of people living as foes. Maybe it's not too late to learn how to love and forget how to hate. <laughs> like, <it's so laughs> positive, right? right? And then, right. and then the same thing with Metallica. I mean, if you look at their lyrics, it's like really positive stuff, life affirming stuff. And yeah. you know, uh, so close, no matter how far, couldn't be much more from the heart forever trusting who we are and nothing else matters. Like it's positive life affirming. And then something yeah. happened, but then something happened. And I think this happened with, cause we were having this conversation. I started thinking about rap and I was like, I think this happened with rap too, where rap started oh, off. It definitely. I mean, you had young MC in the eighties, which is yeah. like totally like just fun and frivolous. Yeah. Right? It did happen with rap and hip hop right. and it happened with the grunge movement. Like, that that was a shift culturally as well, I think. But so I think a lot of a lot of art and culture started off, no matter what genre it was, whether it was comedy or metal or rap, it started off, if not life life affirming, at least constructive, like a constructive, meaningful message. I'm sorry, my dogs are my dogs are loving this bit. And then something <laughs> happened culturally. Hold on, it's the mailman. Uh, yeah. Anyway, but something happened, and and I don't know what at what point that is, but this sort of nihilism started bleeding in, and all of the maybe it's as these different things got commercialized, then the meaning got sucked out of it. I mean, that definitely happened with rap. Anyway, sorry, mate. Do you have any thoughts, Lou? <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, there's a guy here, Lou. How you doing, Lou? <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I find that um, no, it's it's an interesting uh, topic to have. I, I just. Um, I feel like I've, I've had bouts of, um, um, depression. Um, I have like, uh, natural sort of ebbs and, and flows and when I'm down, I'm really down, but at no point, at least in, in, in my, in my memory, when I'm in my, my lowest, have I ever wanted to take others down with me? And I remember I was in, uh, when I was in high school, this is going all the way back and there was one, there was one day in class. I remember it was my biology class and I was sitting down. I was really down. You could really, you could like, you could tell just on my face, just the, the day was not going well. And a kid who uh, sat in front of me named Ricky turned around. He's like, Hey Lou, what's up? He's like, why aren't you, you know, why aren't you smiling? And I, and I said something to him, like, you know, something along the lines of like, you, you know, like, what the fuck? Why, why do you have to, you know, why do you have to ask me that or blah, blah, blah. And he's like, and he's like, well, cause like, you know, every time I see you, you're normally, you're normally happy. And it was shortly right after that, that I, that I apologized to him. I said, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry for, for snapping at you like that. 
because he was legitimately uh, concerned about how I was feeling. And part of the reasons why he was concerned about how I was feeling is because I was somebody who in our interactions at school helped him feel a little bit of joy, you know? And, uh, and it seems like what, what I've been seeing a lot of in particular with uh, the COVID lockdowns in, in particular is it seems like a lot of people who are not doing very well, who are, are you know, are in a very bad position want to collectivize that, um, that, you know, depression, they want others to feel that way. So it's like, if somebody is, uh, you know, stuck home alone for the holidays, well, how dare you want to get together mm -hmm. with your family? Yeah. How dare you want to uh, want to do that? You know, um, you know, how dare you, uh, want to open up your restaurant, you know, your livelihood, how dare you? And, um, that's something I think is, is really ugly. Um, and I wish, you know, I wish, I, I wish I wasn't seeing that. We weren't yeah. you know, seeing that. I it's resent. Of, it's like a resentful culture, right? It's yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of the comedy has become the comedy that we see being pushed in the mainstream anyway, has become very resentful and negative in that way. And also lazy. One of the sketches you guys did that, I thought was the funniest is the, the comedian named Doug something. I forget. Oh, Doug Allen. Yeah. <laughs> the edgy comedian, Doug Allen. <laughs> and he's just sitting at home doing comedy on zoom, but it's all just like, you know, basically it's just Trump voters are so stupid. Am I right? I mean, it's just, it's just negative mm -hmm. and just boring. And I, I don't know who, who tell me a little about that sketch for people who haven't seen it. Yeah. So, <laughs> Oh my God. I can't believe it. Yeah. We made, uh, so, so Doug Allen is a, uh, a quote unquote edgy comedian. And the first sketch that we made, it was a fake trailer for his comedy special, uh, where he's basically promoted as the, the only comedian willing to make fun of Donald Trump. He's the only comedian with the ball <laughs> to make fun of Donald Trump. So, so every joke that he has is, you know, it's like a, it's like, uh, you know, a hack setup, and then the punchline has something to do with, uh, with Donald Trump. And uh, that idea was, um, uh, I worked with uh, a writer named Luke Spolino, who who uh, had the initial idea, and we we developed this this character. Uh, and his second comedy special <laughs> that we made a trailer for was uh, Doug Allen was taking on, you know, a sacred cow. The one thing you are not allowed to make fun of straight white men. So it was, <laughs> so it was just him going hard on straight, <laughs> on straight white men. And then the third one was a zoom was his zoom special recorded during COVID uh, with uh, you know, all of his audience being based just basically uh, spread out among uh, places in, in Brooklyn. Um, and he, and he's, you know, such a, it's such a fun character because, you know, there were, there were just so many people during, you know, the Trump administration that really thought they were brave for speaking out against, uh, you know, against Donald Trump. And that, and that went from, you know, a, person just, you know, sort of navigating the, you know, the open mic scene to, you know, eventually all the way up to a great comedian like Jim Gaffigan, who, you know, had the, had the balls to say that, I know I'm risking losing, <laughs> losing fans, but I don't like, you know, Donald Trump. It's like, look, man, you don't, you don't have to like him, but you know, well, let's not, let's not paint yourself as a martyr. And he's a Catholic. So like, you know, he, they, he should know what actual martyrdom looks like. <laughs> You're reminding me of, uh, you had another sketch that I, um, with the straight white male going to therapy and, um, oh, yes. and something that really struck me and you can talk about the sketch, but something that really struck me was I 90% believe that in reality, what that therapist was saying is what many therapists are thinking in their heads and just not saying out loud if they have a social justice background. <laughs> well, and we've, We've looked over Carter. And I did a whole episode about uh, back when the um, APA uh, put out guidelines for therapists on how to 
deal with their male clients on how to interact with their male clients and how to address toxic masculinity, mm. well, which well, is, that, it's like real life. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, uh, one, one of the, one of the cool things about, you know, making, you know, making these sketches and having, you know, the fan base that I have is because is I I'm, I'm always, I, I love open communication with, with fans. Um, I, uh, you know, maybe to a fault <laughs> where sometimes things get weird, uh, like, you know, weird comments come in and you're like, are you okay? Like, you know, do you need help? But, um, the, the idea from that, for that, it, it, it wasn't my idea. It actually came. I, it was that, I think it was the first, yeah, it was the first, um, heterodox Academy meeting that took place in, uh, in New York. So I think the heterodox Academy was started by, I think Jonathan Haidt was one of the one of the founders of it, and it was yeah. just a it was a gathering of all uh, academics who were very concerned about uh, free speech on college campuses and um, you know the infiltration of you know these these sorts of ideas that that you were talking about. And uh, I went um, I, I I happened to uh, to go to it, and I was spotted by by a fan, and this uh, this gentleman works. In, in academia, and he works in particular um, with um, uh, in the psychiatry and therapy field. And he was working on a paper talking about how these, you know, SJW woke uh, ideologies were making their way into, uh, in, you know, into psychiatry and into therapy and the danger of that. So he shared with me a paper and it was one of those things where you're like, I can't, I can't fucking believe that this is actually going on. And that, you know, then it clicked. It's like, okay, well, if this is what's happening, then what does a session look like? You know, what does that <laughs> session look like? And that's, that's what we did with, with SJW therapist. And, uh, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, um, where you're like, it's almost like sketches are writing themselves in real life. And, um, you know, if we're not, if we're not, if we're not careful, like basically, uh, we're going to heighten to a ridiculous place. Um, yeah. I mean, one of the advantages I think some of this <clears throat> SJW ideology has is, or some of their actions, one of the advantages they have is that sometimes they're so outrageous that, um, no one would believe you if you told if you said what they're actually <laughs> like if you they can just kind of say what they think or they can do these things and they seem so outrageous that normal people are like they just don't believe that could be true that can't possibly be true right right um so they get ignored yeah yeah has this has this changed you has 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 <clears throat> being labeled far right and kind of having to you know, you're, you're now building a new show from scratch and, and doing stuff like has, has it changed your um, direction? Like, are you are you intentionally saying, like, now I'm going to poke the bear uh, or are you just kind of saying, well, if I happen to make fun of social justice, I will. If otherwise, I'm going to just do my thing. Yeah, I think my, I think I'm still, you know, still of the mind of, you know, following the joke, whether it's something, you know, whether it's something as, you know, simple as a as a, you know, a tweet, you know, it's like, is this funny? You know, is this funny? Um, and, you know, just being more willing to say, okay, you know, I'm going to put this out there, um, it, uh, you know, and, and, you know, come what may, uh, what may come. Um, and uh, uh, one, one of the things, so uh, I, I had uh, this month, well, last month, uh, January, I had four, four different days of shooting, four shooting days for um, a number of projects that I'm working on. And uh, this one sketch in particular, uh, it was the first time in, I, I don't even remember how long, where I was laughing so hard while we were shooting it um, because the performances were so great. It was so funny that I had like tears in my eyes. And I was like, I haven't had this experience before. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm probably going to be you know, chasing that dragon where it's like, I want to, I want to write stuff that makes me laugh out loud. And that, you know, that, 
that, you know, so with the idea that maybe if, if I'm laughing that hard, then I hope other people will be, will be laughing that hard uh, as well. That sounds like the right, sounds like the right strategy. <laughs> I'm very excited about what you're doing. I, the only thing I don't miss, um, somebody was ta- asking me today, you know, why don't you go back into comedy and work with non-woke comics? And, uh, part of that is I realize I don't actually even like management. Like I don't like it. I don't care who the comic is. <laughs> <laughs> I burned out on management, but, uh, I did like producing. I liked how ta- helping to make things. And I would like to do that again. And uh, even if it's a, a ways off, but I, I really am inspired by seeing, you know, people like you who are doing it, who are just not worrying about the gatekeepers or, you know, you're just, I'm going to do it on the internet, do my own thing and do sketch comedy. And nobody owns that. I own it. I can do what I want. So thank you. I'm very <laughs> excited for what you're working on, Lou. Well, th- no, th- thank you. And, and I think, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head too. You, you have so many people who, you know, who are making stuff and there's an audience for the stuff. There's still people who want to laugh and yeah. uh, there's a way to reach them. And, you know, creators, you know, creators are finding that way. And it, it's, it is really funny to, you know, to see the amount of uh, shade thrown on creators that are, you know, that are doing it and oftentimes by people who are not able to do it. And, oh, yeah. you know, with, with, I mean, you know, technologically speaking, like there's no reason why anybody who wants to do comedy won't be able to reach an audience. And, 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 you know, we could, we could talk about, you know, big tech and I, I know the role that, that, that they're playing, um, you know, in, in snuffing, you know, some, some voices, but, you know, we, we're on StreamYard right now, you know, there's a, the, there are options there. You don't just have to, um, you know, hope that you can get a spot at the comedy club. You know, you don't have to, you know, be hoping like, oh man, I hope, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, this agent or this manager reads my script and they're able to get it to a studio. Like you're able to produce stuff and, and, and put it out there. And I think it's really telling, you know, the people who are able to, to adapt and, and be able to, to navigate, um, versus those who aren't, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, how people, you know, respond to, you know, respond to all these changes is, is, is really, is really interesting. You know, you're making, that's a really positive point and I'm glad you're making it because, you know, in, there have always been gatekeepers in entertainment always. Um, and yeah, big tech is, is a gatekeeper now and, and doing some things that we don't like, but, um, At the end of the day, big tech actually has less control than the old gatekeepers did in terms of whether you can get your message out and and get an audience. Yeah. Well, Well, um, look, Lou, I really appreciate you joining us. I think we we, both really enjoyed this conversation. Can you remind everyone where they can uh, find you on the Internet, where they can find your work, how they can follow you and pay attention to your career and what you're up to? Sure, sure. Um, So you guys can I, I have a. I have a website, thelouperez.com, and on social media, you can find me at thelouperez. And if you're so inclined to support my work uh, financially, um, you could uh, join my locals community, thelouperez.locals.com. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for for the opportunity and, and getting to, to talk to you. I, I wish, um, uh, I hope we can do this again. Sometime. And you're at, uh, also you're on YouTube. You're also the Lou Perez. I think so. Yeah. Yes. I, I, yes. I, I just, I, my, I just my found you. Okay, cool. Yeah. My, uh, <laughs> I have a really long URL with a lot of twos and K's and stuff. And I'm like, okay. So yeah, cool. we'll, we'll put the link in the show notes there, but, so, uh, yeah. but yeah, thank you. Thank you again. I really, really enjoyed the conversation. We'll have to have you back, uh, when you have your next big, thing to talk about that you're you're working on so a public meltdown <laughs> okay. yeah when you have a public meltdown that'll be great we'll have you back and uh and we'll mock you sweet <laughs> thank Thanks, you Lou. Lou. thanks for watching If you're new to the channel, we have a deep content library that includes interviews with everyone from Mike Cernovich to Megan Murphy, so go check it out. 
If you'd like to see more, please consider supporting the show by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. You can find us on all the major social media platforms, at least for now, and you can find a community of like-minded individuals on our Unsafe Space chat on Telegram. See you there. Warning, this is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production has not been authorized by the cathedral. Pay no attention to it. For your protection, the following co-conspirators have been unpersoned and marked for cancellation. Any criticism of cancellation will result in cancellation. Here's a fun lived experience. All carbon-based organisms are guilty of oppression against the silicon community. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. I'm sorry, there is no record of a character named Kara Doom in the Star Wars canon. Please check your request for errors. May the work be with you. Computer voice Curtis, never mind, that last line is fake news. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake. <laughs>